Acts chapter 13 is where we're going to go right now in a series where we're talking about who we are. And I'll be honest, in some ways, this is who we are. It's also who we want to be. These are what we call fluencies. This describes what we want to be fluent in. Acts chapter 13, if you're ready, say, let's do it. Verse 20, all this took place about 450 years. And after this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, and by the way, what a bummer to have to be removed by God. Not just retired, but removed. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. A man after my own heart. Maybe more than anything, I would love to be a man after God's own heart. There's a lot of ways that you could describe me or you or us. Imagine how great it would be that on your tombstone in heaven, inscribed by God himself, would be a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And from this man's descendants, verse 23, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus, as he promised. I want to talk about Saul and David and Jesus. I want to talk specifically about this difference that I'm mildly obsessed with at the moment between David and Saul, King David and King Saul. The difference was not the absence of failure because if either one of these is familiar to you, you will be familiar with the fact that David was not a man that was not acquainted with failure because he was a man that knew failure all too well. But the difference between tragic Saul and precious David was David was a man after God's own heart. I want to talk today about servant leadership. What is servant leadership? Let's pray. God help. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Slap someone high five. Say, let's do this. Sometime back, it was after dinner, and I was craving a hot fudge sundae. I try to eat healthy for the most part, but I have a bit of a sweet tooth. Anyone else have a sweet tooth in the room? So I went to an unnamed restaurant looking for a hot fudge sundae, and when I came to this fast food restaurant that I will not name, When I got there and asked for the Sunday, they said, oh, this was after waiting in line behind four or five other cars. They said, oh, I'm sorry, sir, our ice cream machine is. Oh, you've been there. But I was undeterred because this has been such a prosperous organization that there was, there's one on almost every corner. And so I went to another part of town and I went there. But sure enough, when I got there, the news was no better. It was still the same evil news. Our machine is broken, to which I started to wonder about this. I asked the person, I said, is there something you could do? And they said, there's nothing I can do. I said, do you understand why this is, there's nothing I can do. Now, I I got struck by this, and so I, kid you not, I, I Google searched this. There is a website called mcbroken.com. So if I were to pull it up, for example, I've got it queued up right now. If I go to mcbroken.com, right now, if I wanted to visit this restaurant here in our city, right now they have maps with red lights, green lights, or gray lights if it's unconfirmed. But right now, where I stand as we speak now, there are, oh, oh, this is good. One of the broken machines has gotten better since last service. And they show you green. So for example, as we speak at this moment now, And right now, 10.43% of all the machines in America are broken. In New York, 20.41% of all the machines are broken. In Dallas, 19.35%. Sir, there's nothing we can do. Now, I contrast that with I did not do this on a Sunday, but I was another day of the week because God's favorite chicken is not available on Sundays. And there was a little problem with my order, and I went to the person, which was the lowest person on the totem pole of power in the organization. I said, surely there's something you can do. They said, oh, sir, it would be my, you've been in this restaurant as well, I can tell. 
It would be my pleasure, they said at Chick-fil-A. God bless them. We live in a moment where there's really, frankly, there's a crisis of service. If you've ever called customer service and wanted to call it customer disservice, if you've ever had them tell you that the machine is broken and there's nothing they can do, even though all the other restaurants seem to be able to make it just fine and they have the same companies, if you've ever been to a place like Chick-fil-A where the service is exceptional, you understand why it gets higher ratings than, than Longhorn Steakhouse and Texas Roadhouse and Outback Steakhouse. You could tell what I'm in the mood for. We live in a moment where there's, there's a crisis of service and there's a crisis of leadership. There's, there's a crisis of both. When we look in the scriptures, and I read to you from Acts 13, which gave you a snapshot. I'm going to try to cover a great deal of scripture today from First and Second Samuel. First and Second Samuel were originally, it was just one book that was written. The scrolls that it was written on were too large. That's why we have First and Second Samuel. But after the rescue of God's people from Egypt, he made a covenant with them that we get from Mount Sinai. We have the Ten Commandments. But God's people, in the midst of a covenant with God, they were not faithful. And when they were not faithful, things would go bad. The times of the judges were a very, very bad time. It was a hard time. God's people ultimately cried out and said, God, we want a king thinking that if they would get a king, that everything would be better, not realizing that the problem of kingdoms is the kings themselves because people always tend to live up or down to the nature of the rulers that they allow to be over them. What we find in this book of Samuel is these first couple of kings of Israel, one whose name is Saul, and Saul is strong and talented and loaded with potential, and yet God removes him. He is a prideful dictator. He's a prideful leader. David, on the other hand, is a man after God's own heart. He is a servant leader. Today, I really just want to say this. Serving is humble. Serving is humbling. Leadership, perhaps the best definition of leadership, is simply influence. Leadership is influence which is why there might be some of you here and you say to yourself, well, I'm not a leader, to which I would say, if you've got any influence at all, you're a leader. If you're a mother, you're a leader. If you're a neighbor, you're a leader. If you're a teacher, you're a leader. Serving is is humbling. Leadership is influence. Servant leadership, therefore, is humble influence. I do not claim to live this out like I want to. I do not claim that any of us live this out like we need to, but I can tell you at Greenhouse, it is our desire that we would be servant leaders. So let's talk about serving. Serving serving is humbling. There's a reason for a crisis of serving, and the reason there's such a crisis of serving, serving is that serving actually is quite humbling. Saul is a leader that we are gonna find out does not really major in this humbling work of, of serving. Perhaps one of the defining characteristics of his leadership we find in 1 Samuel chapter 18, and many of you know the story of David, but in 1 Samuel 18 it says in verse 6, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine Goliath, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang... Saul has slain his thousands. Now, by the way, imagine your king coming back and they're singing songs about you. All the ladies are singing, Saul has slain his thousands. So far, so good. If that was the song, that would be an awesome song. The problem is the ladies kept on singing and the next refrain said, and David has killed his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but with me only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom And from that time, Saul kept a close eye on David. What is the middle letter of the word pride? What is the middle letter of the word sin? A New York survey of 500 phone conversations, a phone company, they did a survey of 500 phone conversations and The most common word among the 500 conversations was the word I, which was repeated 3,900 times. 
2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2 tells us, in the last days, there's going to be perilous times. People will be lovers of themselves. In the last days, people are going to pick up their phones and they're going to take 136 selfies so that you can all look at me, so that you can all pay attention to me. There's a reality about us that we are, at least in the culture of the moment, we are in an endless quest for attention. We want the spotlight. We want recognition. We love titles. We want people to listen to my ideas, and we want everyone to know that was my idea. We want people to know that I'm kind of a big deal. Are you aware of what a big deal that I am? That's, that's sort of the world that we live in, the culture that has become very, very normal. I, I have a feeling in 100 years, people will look back with, with, with like strange looks on how social media performs now in such an egocentric way of, of like abundant accepted narcissism of, of boasting of self and, and, and how much self-promotion takes place. Most of us would not say it, but when an Easter comes up, we think Pastor Byron might say, hey, we need some help out in the parking lot for Easter. We're like, hey, 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 don't ask me to help in the parking lot. Well, could you sit toward the could you sit toward the front of the sanctuary so that on Easter, by the way, I would ask you this, would you move up front so that new people that come in that are kind of freaking out, like they could sit toward the back to which someone might say, no, 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 this is my seat. You could see my butt cheek print on the seat. I'm sorry, but Brooke told me I can talk like I would if I was in the youth group. And so youth, is it okay if I talk like, uh, no, Mary, I shouldn't ask the youth, yeah. Clean dishes, like maybe you, like you already helped clean, make the food and now clean the dishes. You want me to clean the dishes as well? I've been, I've been working all day. Help serve toddlers in the church. Go help out with the youth group. Go pick up trash when I walk by. Pick, don't people know what a big deal that I am, we might say. It's interesting to me, David's path to Goliath, which is what puts him on the map. David gets put on the map because of Goliath. Does anyone know what David was doing when he got put on the map to face Goliath? Someone said he was looking over a few sheep. You're right, he was a babysitter. He was basically a, a sheep babysitter that his brothers made fun of him for and said, oh, go back to your few little sheep that you lead. But I mean, like literally, do you know what David was doing at the moment when his Goliath moment comes? He, he was working for Instacart delivering food. He was an Instacart Uber food driver that was bringing cheese and crackers to his brothers from his dad that said, you know, son, I know your brothers are all important enough to be out in the army. You're just a little babysitter. Could you deliver some food? So Jesus uses David to go pick up some Lunchables at the store and bring them to his brothers. David is delivering lunch food when his Goliath moment comes and he overhears Goliath contending against God's people. And he says, who is this? To which they're like, go back to your sheep and go back to your Uber driving. Who do you think you are? I just find it fascinating that David was a nobody that was doing a nobody's work in the middle of the moment when God advanced him. Let me tell you something I was reading about this week. There was a stormy night many years ago. An elderly couple goes up to a hotel in Philadelphia about one o'clock in the morning, there was nowhere else to, they could not find a hotel anywhere. They go in, they find this nice clerk. They say, hey, do you have any place to stay? He's like, hey, I'm really sorry. There's like three conventions going on in town right now and you're not gonna find something anywhere. They're like, oh, that's just terrible. He's like, but I'll tell you what, listen, we don't, we don't have any rooms available, but you seem like a nice couple. I don't wanna leave you out in the rain. It's one o'clock in the morning. It was an older couple and he said, why don't you just take my room? And they're like, no, no, we can't take your room. He's like, no, no, I insist. Just, just take my room. I'll, I'll, I'll find a way. I'll, I'll make out just fine. They reluctantly agree. They spend the night, have a good night. The next day, they're checking out. And as they go out to check out the bill, the elderly man looks at the clerk and he says, you know, you're the kind of manager who should be the boss of the best hotel in all of the United States of America. Maybe one day I'll build it for you. To <laughs> which the guy chuckles. He's like, oh, that's so nice. What a... What a good thought, what a nice idea, what a good thought. And he thanks them, they have a little chuckle. They, the couple drives away, remarking what a remarkable leader and servant, what a remarkable servant leader this guy was. Two years pass, and the clerk almost has forgotten the whole incident that happened, and he gets a letter in the mail, receives this letter from the old man, recalling the stormy night, recalling what had happened, and he places in with the letter 
a round-trip plane ticket to New York City where he asks, will you come and meet with me? I'd like to have a conversation with you about something. The old man meets him at the corner of Fifth Avenue and 34th Street. Anyone familiar with New York City would know where this is. He points to a great new building, and if you guys want to put it up there, it puts a great new building, a palace of reddish stone with turrets and watchtowers thrusting up into the sky. That, says the old man, is the hotel that I have built for you to manage. You must be joking, the young man says. He says, I can assure you I'm not. A smile slyly put across his mouth. The old man's name was William Waldorf Astor. The magnificent structure was the original Waldorf Astoria Hotel. God's promotion plan is this. He tests you in private before he advances you in public. God loves to lift his people up. God's promotion plan is he gets you delivering food to get you ready to slay a giant. And a lot of us want our Goliath moments, but we didn't serve our Lunchables moments. Serving is admittedly humbling. Now, Saul was not a servant leader. Saul was what I would call a vulture leader. Saul was a leader like many leaders that many of us have known. Saul was a leader that that really took advantage of other people's victories. Like vultures, they feed on someone else's victory. They go and they feed, when they smell the dead food and vultures kind of make their way and they they go and find that dead meat and they eat it. A lot of, you see a lot of politicians doing this. They'll they'll claim credit for an economy that, that when we look back historically, we'll know oftentimes the economy was due to things that happened with the, his predecessor. But, but politicians are famous for doing this, and business people are famous for doing this. Saul was, like, Saul was such a vulture leader that when he had a moment of crisis where his people are in trouble and David slays the giant, Saul cannot take it. It wasn't just David, though. Saul's very own son was named Jonathan. John, there was a moment where, it, it's so interesting, I didn't catch this until reading it this time. There were only two swords in all of Israel. There was only two swords. One was owned by Saul. The other was owned by Jonathan, his son. Because of the Philistines taking charge of a lot of the metal making and all this, there was only two swords in all of Israel. When Goliath comes, the guy that's got the sword, King Saul, he doesn't even use his sword to go fight. David, that's why David had to use a slingshot. The sword that was offered to him was not the right fit for him, and he could not do it. But David has this buddy named Jonathan, which is Saul's son, and there's this one moment when God's people are in trouble, and Jonathan goes up, and he fights against all the odds, takes out a whole battalion, this, this whole group, and when he does, it's like, whew, God's people all of a sudden find relief, and there's this victory, and the Philistines are retreating, and God's people start to come, and now there's victory, and Saul says, go sound the trumpets, and announce to Israel, Saul has brought a victory. Even when his own son does it, Saul, like a vulture, wants to take the credit for it. Saul is this vulture leader. Well, let me, let me give you the contrast to this. 2 Samuel chapter 23, sort of toward the end of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 23, David had some people that were in his, they're called the mighty men. It says, these are the names of David's mighty warriors. Josheb, uh, Bashabeth. It says, he was the chief of the three. He raised his spear against eight hundred men whom he killed in one encounter. I'll tell you what this is. David slayed his tens of thousands. David had guys that could slay even more than David did. Next to him was Eliezer, the son of Dodai, the Ahohite. As one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines, gathered for battle, and then the Israelites retreated, but Eliezer stood, when all the rest of them left, he stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired, froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eliezer, but only to strip the dead. Like vultures, Eliezer was the guy that stood up. It says, next to him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herorite, when the Philistines banded together at a place where there was... There was a field full of lentils. Israel's troops fled from them, but Shammah took the stand in the middle of the field. He defended it, struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought a great victory. Verse 17, such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. 18, Abishai, the brother of Joab, he raised his spear among 300 men whom he killed, and he became famous of the three. Verse 20, Benaiah, he struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. 
and he struck down a huge Egyptian. These guys are like, okay, why are you bringing this up? Here's what I want to point out. When Saul was king, he wanted no one but himself to shine. When David was king, he's got these mighty men that did greater works than David, and David makes sure everybody knows about it. See, serving is humbling. And servant leadership is hard because it involves serving, which, which is humbling. David was a man that said, you know what, I've done great things, but the people with me, I want you to do even greater works than I do. You know, Pastor Brooke is right here on the front row. This is our youth pastor, Pastor Brooke. I was our youth pastor at one time. We've, our church has actually had a string of incredibly good youth pastors. We've had multiple very, very good youth pastors. I think I was a, a pretty good youth pastor. I have to tell you this. I can literally tell you greater works than I did as a youth pastor, Pastor Brooke is doing right now. I, I am not exaggerating. This is not just a preaching illustration. This is an absolute fact. Greater works than I did, greater works than any of her predecessors. That last song we were singing, that was written by some of the youth, like youth, youth leaders at one of their retreats. That song that they were singing right there, that's a result of the youth ministry and her leadership. This is a, a leader and communicator extraordinaire. We ha- she's a female. We have more males. We, and I, I mean, we've got like... We got some serious young men in the youth group right now. If someone's worried, like, well, I wonder if you have a female youth pastor, if, if boys are going to come. We had more young men at Kairos than we've ever had before. Greater works. I've got a heart for prayer. Like, I, I long for us to be a house of prayer. I mean, every Wednesday in our church, just so you know, in the morning, at noon, at night, all day long, we have prayer going on in this room on, on Wednesdays. We want to build a house of prayer. If you've ever got time where you can come at lunchtime on Wednesdays or in the mornings, if you could go before work and you could show up. I long, I, I think I love prayer. I, I long for prayer. This week, we have tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of this week, we're having a three-day fast. This building's going to be open all day, praying for Easter. We think nothing happens unless we bathe things in prayer. We do not have confidence in the flesh, articulate sermons, nice sound systems. We have confidence in Jesus alone. Easter Sunday, we want amazing things to happen. And when, when people look back and say, why did that stuff happen on Easter? I want us to say, because God keeps his promises that when you call to me, I will answer you, says the Lord. Now, I say all that to say, like, I've got a heart for prayer, but we got people in our church, like Pastor Matt, one of our elders, Jorge, one of, our, one of the men in our church, a guy named Gene, has started these watchman prayer nights once a month. There's, they, they started with like four, you know, we, we'll get together for four hours, then it went up to five hours, then it went to six hours, then it went to seven hours. There's nothing quite like kind of praying through the night and just, just getting some men together. Any of you men that ever want to, I, hit one of them up and they'll give you the details. They meet over at someone's house. It's like all night prayer vigils. I, what I'm trying to tell you is this. I have a heart for prayer. There is a rumbling that's happening right now with some of the men in prayer. Greater works than I've done in prayer are they doing right now. Right now we have our, our Navy SEALs. Ruth leads our, our Navy SEALs and this, this group of just really getting everything bathed in prayer. We have a strategy to accomplish the mission of our church, which goes like this. If we can't bathe it in prayer, we don't even want to do it. We're like literally take it off the couch. If we can't bathe it in prayer, cancel it. We don't want to do flesh events. Just, well, that's what churches should do. We would rather do four things that we can bathe in prayer than a hundred things that are in the flesh. So we have Navy SEALs. They're just like Navy SEALs prayer team. It's just a group of, they're, they're just like that. They're like special forces. They gather every week. They just pray for a couple of hours, and they pray into things. They bay things. They listen to God about things. Every, the moves we make, even in our whole church right now, are, are being based on, we make our moves based on what did we hear God say in prayer. When we read the story of David and Saul, when they consulted God, they did well. When they didn't, they did badly. We're like, God, we consult you. We need you. We desire you. Now, I've talked about this for a while. We've got a prayer room right over here. I've been longing to have our prayer room. I mean, even right now as we speak, there are people interceding in that room for you right now. Even some of you online, they're praying for you right now as we speak. In Jesus' name, that we would be covered. Now, here's my point. There's greater works than anything that I've been able to pull off up until now with some of the leadership that we have. I love the way that David seems to have no problem seeing his mighty men do greater works than him. Because it reminds me 
of David's greatest descendant, who would be the son of David, Jesus himself, who would say in John 14, if you believe in me, greater works than I do will you do. And I've heard many people argue about this, like, well, what could be greater than walking on water? Although I've heard of believers that did walk on water. What could be greater than healing the sick? And we've certainly heard of healings, right? What could be greater than raising the dead? Right now as we speak, there are, God is raising the dead. But I think it's deeper than just how cool is the special effect. I remember taking a class at UF where the teacher was saying, you know, if Jesus was so great, why did almost none of the historians say anything about him? There's some of us that wonder if Jesus even existed. Well, we know that Josephus, and you know, you've got little mild amounts of history that's written about Jesus, but why is so little written about Jesus? In fact, there's way greater things written about the apostle Paul than Jesus. What do you have to say about that? If Jesus was so great, why was more made in history of, of his, his followers than him himself? To which I would say, oh, thank you, teacher, for reminding me what Jesus himself said, which was, Greater works than I do, will they do? And here we are 2,000 years later, and the, there are more people bowing their knees to the name of Jesus Christ around this world than any other name because Jesus, like we talked about last week, multiplied, reproduced himself. Serving is humbling, and leadership is influence. Servant leadership is humble influence. What about this, this influence, this idea of influence? Servant leadership is not about using people to accomplish your dreams. It's about stewarding your influence to help them become who God has called them to be and to do what God has called them to do. I love how Psalm 78 describes this a little bit. In, in Psalm 78, we have a description of the opposite of a vulture leader, 78, 72 of Psalms says, And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, and with skillful hands he led them. Saul was a vulture leader who sucked up the victory of others. David was a shepherding leader that pulled out the best in his people. I could not tell you any of Saul's mighty warriors, but we know the name and the names of David's mighty men because they showed up to him in one way, and they became something else. I, I like how when Saul chose his leaders, just to be clear, when Saul chose his leaders, the scripture says he chose among, he was head and shoulders above the rest, and Saul chose talent. He says, you know, I choose you, and 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 he sent the rest home. That's how Saul built his kingdom. Does anybody remember how David got his core leaders of his followers? He was in a cave, and it says everybody who was busted and disgusted and in debt and disgruntled, all, those dis all these misfits, they gathered to David. David gathers misfits. He says, come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I'm going to turn you misfits into mighty men. This is what you call transformational leadership. This is where Jesus would say, come to me. All you that are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Come to me. Oh, you're a fisherman? I will make you to become a fisher of men. Oh, your name is Saul and you're a terrorist and you kill Christians? I'm going to turn you into Apostle Paul. Oh, come to me. Oh, your name is Simon? Oh, that's your name? Oh, that's what people, they called you little pebble? I'm not going to call you Simon. I'm going to call you Peter. Come to me. When I get my hands on you, your life will be so different that literally they would need to change your name to describe you accurately. You know, I know, I realize I just read a book on talent. It was a leadership book saying you got to hire for talent. Choose for talent. Get in the portal. Get all the right talent. Get all the right people. Get all the right talent. But like the 1980 American hockey team found out, you don't always win gold medals just by having the most talented people. You get the right people, and you get them to come together. And there's something about servant leadership that takes people as misfits and turns them into something else. Now, guys, i got to be honest with you. I'm... It, there's probably no one that does this better than parents. I think most of us have seen Saul like vulture leaders that like they wanted to use us for, to, for their own purposes. They wanted to use us to get their wills done or whatever. I think parents might be the best at, at wanting their kids to become who God wants them to be. And, and parents, I just want to appeal to you. Like my, my desire as a parent, I want my children to become who they are supposed to be. 
Sometimes I'll be out in public and one of you sees me with, with my kids. Oh, I've never seen your kids. And, and they'll say things like, oh, what well-behaved children, if they say something like that at times, what well-behaved children, there's always the temptation as a parent that, oh, we want everyone to think our children are so well-behaved. You know what? I mean, my, my, there's nothing, I, I don't know there's anything harder sometimes than being a pastor's kid. Like, what a bummer, you know, please. Can I just tell everyone, like, when you do meet my kids and stuff, please do not put that pressure in them. Like, oh, I, I better go be, I, you know, I remember when I, they need to be all these, these perfect kids or whatever. I want my children to be who God has called my children to be. Amen, right, right? So I, I, don't, I don't need them like measuring up to some religious person's expectation or, or Gainesville's expectation. I want my children, I remember one time one of my kids was playing a sport and, and one of the teachers said, hey, I just wanted to let you know, you, you're Pastor Mike, right? I said, yeah, I said, I want you to know that your, your, your child was um, said, a, said a, a curse word with the other children when they were cursing. I'm like, oh, really? Like, okay, thanks for letting, I, I just want to make sure you knew that. I'm like, because you're a pastor and all. And I'm like, oh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Dude, did any of the other parents find out about this? Why, and I'm like, well, well, it was, it was the F word. I'm like, what, what is the F word? I don't know what the F word is. Could you tell me what it is? I, these are virgin ears. I don't, I'm a pastor. I wouldn't even know what the F word is. <laughs> I remember talking to one of my, you know, talking to my child and they're, you know, finding out about this. I said, listen, just F them, you know, just F them and forgive, forgive them. The F word is forgive, just forgive them, you know, just go chill, you know, go ahead and chill. See, Saul chose for talent and good looks. There's even churches these days, like even today, there's churches, like for their online services, literally, there are churches they, that like the first four or five rows of people, they only let certain people get up what might be online, what everyone sees online, they've got to be like the, the most beautiful people, the most amazing people, the most incredible people. They have to, you know, like that's who they kind of stock up there. I mean, I won't lie. We did that as well. So if you do see the first couple rows, <laughs> congratulations, guys. That is... <laughs> no, but that's serious. Like there really are churches that will be like, hey, we, we want to make sure if someone sees us, they're going to know we are, we're very beautiful. We're very talented. We're very celebrity-like. And yet Jesus goes and chooses misfits, and turns them into disciples that have turned the world upside down. Misfits. Jesus gets his hands on people, and they become something else. Serving is humbling. Leadership is influence. Serving leadership, servant leadership is humble leadership. It is transformational leadership that has objectives. And our church we are trying to plant microchurches in 67 counties across the state of Florida. We are trying to help ordinary people become passionate followers of Jesus Christ. There are things that we want to do with, with the youth. There are things that we want to do on UF and Santa Fe campus. There are things that we want to do. But i got to tell you, if one of you comes to me and you're like, Mike, what's the vision of our church? I would probably ask you questions and say, you tell me, what has God put in your heart? Because my desire is not simply to squeeze I don't know, all the juice out of you to get us to accomplish our vision. We want you to become who God wants you to be. That's why we do microchurches. Like we do these, we have like hundreds of microchurches because microchurches are outlets for people to, to say when, they, when they're like, man, I feel called to the juvenile detention center. Awesome, let's go plant a microchurch there. I, I feel called to East Gainesville. Awesome, we're gonna go do things in East Gainesville. I feel called to, to mothers that are going through, you know, they, they've had miscarriages. Great, let's go do something with mothers who, see, wherever God might put a vision in your heart to glorify him, serve people, love people, we wanna help you perform and accomplish that dream. I don't just want you accomplishing my dream to come, even when it comes down to when people say, well, are you going to get all the micro, do, do you make all the micro churches do X, Y, Z? We don't make all the micro churches do anything. I want to use Sundays to serve micro churches. I'm not asking micro churches to come serve what I do on Sundays. Servant leadership is, is humble influence. You know, I think of someone like our, our missions director, Andrea Serafin. Andrea is becoming one of the greatest missions minds of anybody I've heard. Like, we're, we're in a movement where we do a, lot, we do a lot of things with missions. Mark my words, in the next 10 years, like, Andrea is becoming this great missions mind 
that has got a heart. Like in the next 10 years, we're hoping to, to send 100 missionaries to the, to the foreign mission field. And I mean, there's some of you that are listening to me now that I'm praying to God that he will speak to your heart and tell you, you are supposed to go where the gospel has never been before. And we want to help you do that. And Andrea Serafan came in one way, but well, I want, but by the time she, by the time I get my hands on her and you get your, I want us to be the kind of church that when we get our hands on people, they become everything God made for them to be. Pastor Byron was a professor at the University of Florida. Here he is now helping lead our, our work with, with our macro church, large group experiences. And man, he's just, there's this passion for both, for a harvest of people that will come and meet Jesus, but also God's presence. In general, churches tend to either be a place where lots of lost people come and get found, or you get God's presence. And we're like, God, we actually want lost people to get found, and we want found people to run after God. We don't want to compromise the presence of God. We don't want to compromise the, the harvest of God. We want all all of that. We're like, God, show us the way to do it. And Byron is a man that is, that is becoming this mind of figuring these things out with his genius mind that he has for systems and other things. Jesus has come to me and I will make you to become something you never imagined. And there's some of you, I, I want to let you know, there's some of you that are listening to me now and right now you're sinful and you're not going to stay that way. And right now you're confused and you are not going to stay that way. And right now, you, you're afraid, but you are not going to stay that way. Because as, as one woman said in a chosen episode, I, I was one way, and now I'm completely different, and that thing that happened in the middle was him. Jesus says, you come to me, and I'm going to make you, I will, I will knock the sin, I will take that sin out of you. I will give you wisdom for your confusion. I will give you faith for that fear. Because when you come to Jesus, he knows how to influence people into something totally different. Mike, how do I apply this sermon? Simple. Number one, if you see a need, meet the need. Be, if, be faithful in the little. Be eager to help. If you need a good starting point, Easter's a great. We need a truckload of help on Easter Sunday. Go out there and let them know I'm here. A couple weeks ago, I was on, a, uh, on an elevator. I saw this guy. And I was like, whoa, man. I said, don't I know you? He was older, but I'm like, don't I know you? And he says, he says yeah. And he's the president of a university here in the, in the United States. I was like, oh, that's right. And we both got our master's degree at the same time. We were in the same master's. It was a kind of a cohort program. I was like the youngest guy in this thing. He was a little bit, he was older than me, but um, he was in this program. He is now the president of this university. Here's how I found out about him, though. He had been a youth pastor years earlier. And when he was a youth pastor, he's making like $25,000 a year. One day he's walking down the hallway at his church and there was trash on the ground and he picked up trash. Well, his pastor noticed this and he was consistently, whenever he saw trash, most people, most members, most staff members, most people just walk by. They walk by trash. That's someone else's job. Everywhere this guy went, he would just, you know what? He would just bend down, serve, and pick up the trash. One day his pastor saw him doing this. He went back to their deacon board. He said, you know, guys, we're paying this guy 25 grand. I think there's something great in this man. He, he's, he's a servant's heart. He has a servant's heart. They immediately gave him a $25,000 raise. His salary doubled in one day from twenty five dollars to $50,000 for picking up trash. I'm telling you, a lot of us are waiting for Goliath. God's waiting for the Lunchables. One way you can serve, just if you see need me, if there's trash, pick it up. You go to someone's house, do, make them beg you to stop doing dishes. Go ahead and ask them, can I help do the dishes? You're like, well, I hate dishes. Good. It's good for you. You could say, well, don't you know who I am? D do you want to be a king? Number two, application. Ask God, Lord, who have you called me to influence? Debbie Parks is a woman I think about in our church who is a servant leader. She works with our children's ministry. They just did a movie night with the girls this past Friday. Debbie Parks has written notes to almost all of my children in the kids' ministry. She prays over them. She weeps for them. She leads them. She thinks about them. She sacrifices for them. She serves them. She is a servant leader. Now, if someone asked me right now, who are some of the greatest leaders in Gainesville, Florida, I would tell you one of the greatest leaders in Gainesville, Florida is a woman named Debbie who serves these children. You could say, well, that's just a few kids. Yeah, that's exactly who Jesus has called her to reach. There's something amazing about knowing what God has called you to do. One of the reasons some of us struggle so much with insecurity is because we don't know what God has called us to do. 
And when you don't know what God's called you to do and who he's called you to be, you wrestle when some woman walks in and she's more talented than you. Or some guy walks in and he's better looking than you. Or someone comes in and they're more influential than you. When you know what you've been called to do, you don't care when someone else catches passes when you were called to throw passes. You don't care when someone else runs fast when you're called to be big, bulky. You're called to be big and chunky and you're supposed to go and mow people down as a lineman, Okay. I like them big. I like them chunky, okay? Maybe that's the kind of football. That's, what is that from? I don't even know what movie that's from. Is that Madagascar? That great prophetic thing. Servant leadership is being so committed to the others that God has called you to that you are willing to make sacrifices like a servant. It is choosing to go last even when you deserve to go first. It is doing the job or ministry no one else is willing to do because you know that the king is watching when no one else is. It is spreading the credit even if you deserve it more. It is giving up the spotlight, taking up the towel, and serving. So this week, Harvard Business Review had an article called How Humble Leadership Really Works. Take, for example, it says, this, this whole concept of top-down leadership by focusing too much on control and goals and not enough on the people. The key then, according to Harvard Business Review, is to help people feel purposeful, motivated, and energized so they can bring their best selves to work. There's many ways to do this, but... The, among the best ways, it says, is to adopt the humble mindset of a servant leader. Servant leaders view their key roles as serving employees as they explore and grow, providing tangible and an emotional support as they do. To put it bluntly, servant leaders have the humility, courage, and insight to admit that they can benefit from the expertise of those who have less power around them. Now, we read this in servant leadership. You can read books like Leaders Eat Last, and you can read about the servant, and there's all these books. And it's, I mean, even right now, secular business would tell you what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, what David did more than 3,000 years ago. They would tell us what is true. The problem is, the message today is simply this. Hey, church, let's go be servant leaders. Let's go be humble influencers, to which I'm hoping everyone says. The problem is, we can't, or we won't, at least not like we should. Because if I'm honest about the story of King David, David did not always use his power for good. David did not always steward his influence and position. There would come a time when David would exploit his position, assault a woman, murder her husband, bring bloodshed on an entire kingdom. And it would disappoint so many people. And even right now, everybody, even in the culture we're in, everyone's looking for that leader we can follow. Like, who's the leader we can follow? Where's the king we can finally hang our hat on? What celebrity is worthy of our adoration? What, what athlete won't disappoint us and, and go, you know, have guns that he's sharing with other basketball players? What, what, who's going to, God, we, all, all we like Saul and David have gone astray. We long to have a David's heart, but we don't want David's sin. And that's why I really end this to tell you that if you want to become a servant leader, I believe you need to come to the servant leader. In John chapter 13, the son of David himself, whose name was Jesus, it says, it was just before the Passover festival and Jesus knew that the hour had come. For him to leave this world to go to his father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. You'll never be a servant leader until you're secure. See, Jesus was secure because he knew something. He knew where he was coming from and he knew where he was going and he knew whose he was and he knew who he was. And he knew who he wasn't. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, Iscariot, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things into his hands and under his power, that he had come from God, he was returning to God. 
Jesus now knew he had all the power. He had all the authority. He had, he had all of it. He had all the leverage. He had the keys that you would need. He had all that you would need. And the question is, when you've got all the power, when you've got all the authority, what do you do in that moment when it's like once and for all, you get to go show the world what you're like? He's kind of been incognito up until now. And now he's got that spot where he can do anything. He can say anything. He can do any miracle. He can multiply any loaf. He can multiply any fish. He can walk on any water. He can heal any disease. He can do all the powers in his hands. And the question is, what does Jesus do in the moment? This is the end of his life. Luke gives us a detail that John, this gospel does not give us. It tells us that while they're walking to this dinner, some of the disciples are arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, assuming he will be a political messiah. Who's going to be the minister of the interior? Who's going to be the chief of state? Who's going to, be, who's going to take the right and left hand of this man's kingdom? And Jesus is like, you've been with me all this time, and you still don't understand. You're still missing my heart. I want a people that have a heart after my heart. I want men and women who have hearts after mine. And with all the power in his hands, with all the authority, the question is, what does Jesus do when given all the power? Well, it tells us. He got up from the meal. He gets up from his place of honor. He took off his outer clothing, and he wrapped himself with a towel. After that, he poured water into a basin, gets on his knees, and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. It was a menial task. It was a humbling task. It was a ceremonial task. It was a hospitality task, but it's something that nobody, it was demeaning. And no one else has arranged for what should have been arranged for the foot washing. With the towel that was girded around him, Jesus goes to these Palestinian Jews who are not walking on concrete. They're walking on dust and dirt and mud and dust. And he takes the dirt that was on them and he puts it on himself. He goes up to a Judas that's going to betray him, and he takes the feet of Judas, and with the towel that was wrapped around himself, he puts it on him. And with the dirt that would be on Peter, who would deny him, he puts it on him. And Peter's like, no, 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 you're not going to do this for me. And Jesus says something telling. He says, Peter, if I don't wash you, you can't have any part of me. That's what baptism is, by the way. Some people are like, well, I don't want to get baptized. It would be so humbling. He's like, if you don't let me wash you. He goes to Thomas, who would doubt him, and the disciples who would run. And by the time he's done, he's girded with a towel that is covered in the stench, stink, and stains of them. And he says, Peter, you don't get what I'm doing right now, but one day you're going to understand. Because I'm going to go up on a cross. And when I go up on this cross, I'm going to be on a cross where this body that is wrapped around this being called the Son of God, the Son of David. He's, he's the Son of David according to the flesh. Means the Son of David, a reality about him is, it's, it's his physical body. And on the body with which he was girded on a cross, he would wipe my sins. Like, I'm here this morning clean, not because I'm good. It's because he washed me. And then he took your pride and your lust and your adultery and your secrets and, and your gossip and your slander and your anger and your pornography, and, and, he, and he wiped it on himself. When he looked at him, he was disgusting. The Bible says there was no form or comeliness. There was no beauty in him that we should desire him. No wonder he was wrapped in our, in our grossness, our, in, our, in our stains and stench. Men turned their heads away. It was too disgusting to even look at. He said, do you know what I've done? And Peter's like, yeah, I get it. No, no, you didn't get it. He says, if I've washed your feet, and here's the application, go wash each other's feet. Because we serve the king 
who gets on his knees and washes feet. When he gets of power and authority, he doesn't use his power to build himself up. He uses his power to wash us clean. Some of us in this room have used our power to put people down, to spread rumors, to put people in their place. And he's calling us to follow the one who takes up a towel and serves. Greenhouse, I'm calling us, not because I'm so good at this, I'm calling us because Jesus is, to be servant leaders. But if you've never put your faith in Jesus, today is the day, because I'm telling you, the leader of all leaders, the savior of all saviors, the king of all kings, the servant of all servants, is the Messiah Jesus, King, son of David himself. There's no one like him. There is no one like him. There's no leader like him. I know you've been waiting for the right boss at work, trust me. You've been waiting for the right king in your heart, not just the right manager in that corner office. You're not just waiting for the right coach, for the right leader, for the right manager. You've been waiting for the right king. Let him in. Let him wash you if he hasn't yet, and you'll never be the same.